start? All right, so, wow, we made it to the last session. Fantastic. So um, I'm going to be showing a lot of different slides, and I just want to make sure you guys can find them all. So what I did is if you go to biocodes, that's where I tweet, uh, the very one of the tweets you're going to see is I put all, all three of my talks up there, and on the fourth line, you're going to see this document, and if you click on that document, um, you will see the entire agenda for all three of my talks. So if you came for the iOS talk, you will see all the slides I did for that one, the augmented reality, the slides for that one, um, and the entire agenda for it. And then if you come to the Android talk tomorrow, I have all the slides and the source code and everything um, for, for that talk. So for the augmented reality talk, these are the two slides, and this is the GitHub repository we're going to be going through. Now, it is the last session of the, of the day, so I'm going to start off with something a lot lighter than just dro dropping into code. And one of the things we'll notice is that when we do augmented reality, it's actually the hardest part is coming up with a great idea and great models. So I want to talk a little bit about imagination, the beginning of science. It actually turns out to do augmented reality, it's three lines of code. So when I show you how to code augmented reality, you're going to be surprised at how simple it is. But the imagination is, is probably one of the most important parts of augmented reality and what we're going to be building. So, you know, uh, some famous quotes up here, uh, like Albert Einstein said, the true sign of intelligence is not knowledge but imagination. And what people say is like, Knowledge is limited, but imagination is infinite. So really uh, helping have a good imagination is really important. There's lots of great ways to uh, improve your imagination. Uh, you can open your mind to new paths. Uh, read really helps out. Be curious about things. Um, don't be afraid to try something new. Expand your interests. Uh, spending time with creative people. Uh, look differently at things, uh, and condition your mind to relax through meditation techniques. All these things help increase our imagination. And as we get deeper into the AR stuff, you're going to see the imagination is really the key to it. So one of the things I like to do is uh, I like to go to a party, and um, I just tell people, you know what, uh, I'm a Jaeger pilot. I've been piloting for seven years. I have uh, four Kaju kills. Uh, one solo, three, three combined, and I, I keep with that story throughout the entire party. It just helps like get the get the imagination going. So people ask me like, "What do you do?" Oh, I'm a I'm a you know I'm a Jaeger pilot. <laughs> so um, there's a there's a strong link between uh, imagination and innovation. It's people say that necessity is the mother of invention, but after a lot of research, what they actually found out. It's curiosity that is the mother of uh, invention. So imagination really has to do a lot with our ability to move our, ourselves forward. One of the uh, schools I, I interact with a lot is the D school. And the D school has like this design thinking to actually help people come up with imaginative um, uh, products. Uh, and if you're interested, there's a link at the bottom about uh, the D school, and they have some of their courses online to help you do design thinking. Now, imagination has boundaries, right? So you have to be able to explain to people uh, what you're talking about when you're talking about your imagination. Like, you can't s describe a dragon with a tomato, right? It just doesn't work. Where you want to talk about a, a dragon, it's a lizard with, with wings and it breathes fire. So you have to give people a context in which you're going to talk about your imagination. And that's the uh, Maya principle. He basically says when you design for the future, you go as far as you can to push the imagination, but it has to look familiar. So you go, OK, I'm going to build something that is really futuristic, but people can relate to with, which, with what they have in the present. And this guy was really, really um, famous for all of his futuristic designs. He did some really amazing work, and that was his principle. Now, there's a deep link between imagination and science. Uh, Isaac Asimov had a PhD in chemistry. Uh, 
Robert Hillman. He uh, graduated in mathematics and physics at UCLA. Uh, Michael Crichton, he is an MD. Arthur C. Clarke actually uh, developed a radar and geosynchronous orbit. So we see that there's a, a really strong link between uh, science and science fiction. In fact, we have uh, Clarke's three laws. Um, these are the three laws that, that we see uh, in Clarke's books. Uh, when there is a distinguished but elderly scientist states something is impossible, he is almost uh, certainly right. When he states something that is impossible, he is very probably wrong, <laughs> right? The only way to discover limits of possibility is to venture a little past them uh, into the impossible. And any significant advancements in technology is indistinguishable from magic. And that's the realm in which my company does a lot of their work. Uh, we build uh, technology that helps people know that they're getting sick before a doctor can. And you can talk to me about that, but it really starts looking like magic at some, at, at the way we use technology. Um, I just want to touch on the product uh, life cycle. It starts with imagination, and then you have the product design, and then there's a lot of math, physics, and chemistry that goes along, and then engineering, and you pop out magic, and that magic brings about more imagination, and that imagination, and it just kind of cycles through where we're building on uh, imagination coming reality, and then that's pushing us, and then that reality starts looking like magic, which makes our imagination uh, work better. So uh, Mark Twain famously said, truth is stranger than fiction. That's because fiction is obtained by what is possible, where, uh, where yeah, so truth is stranger than fiction, because uh, truth is embedded in reality where fiction can be anything. Pretty impressive. And a lot of the kind of technology we're seeing these days is actually coming from science fiction. Uh, like there are now people who are trying to build tricorders where you just touch uh, an instrument to someone's body and they know how their entire uh, medical uh, condition. So that brings us, brings us to augmented reality. We actually, the first place we saw augmented reality was in The Wizard of Oz. So again, we see that um, Science fiction is showing us where, uh, where science is going to be going. And the first real um, augmented virtual reality we actually saw was in 1954 at the World's Fair, which is uh, pretty cool. So 1957, we've been thinking about this kind of stuff. Now, the way that technology generally works is human beings think linearly, and technology moves exponentially. So when we start a new technology, People overhype what it can do in the beginning because they're thinking linearly and the technology hasn't caught up to what they want it to do. Then people get really disappointed in the technology and they start walking away and that's when the technology starts becoming very powerful and it starts growing really rapidly. And this is, you see this in all the, of the um, hype cycles of new technology that's coming out. So, you know, the web was really hyped, uh, and then it, it kind of crashed, and now we're seeing it bloom. You're going to see the same thing with augmented reality. In the beginning, people are going to say it's going to do a lot of amazing things, and then people are going to get disenchanted. That's when we come in, we work really hard, and as the technology gets better, we do amazing things, and then people are like, wow, that's amazing, because the technology will move exponentially, and people think linearly. So the first, uh, this is a very good example of uh, an AR project that came out. So um, this company wanted to come up with an idea to use augmented reality in showing people what uh, their kitchens would look like in the future. So they asked people to think about it, and they got people who write comic books. And they said, come up with great, crazy ideas. So the, the people in the, with the comic books wrote ideas down and then they made a comic book about it, and they used the comic book to sell that to senior management. Senior management said, that's a great idea, and then they went off to make the technology. Um, and now, if you go into Lowell's, what happens is they have uh, a tablet that you hold up, and you go choose from the inventory what you want your kitchen to look like. 
they move that into the tablet and you just hold up the tablet into this uh, mock kitchen and you can actually see what your uh, cabinets and all of your furniture looks like uh, before you have to actually build it into your, your kitchen. There's another company uh, that is doing augmented reality for um, construction and what they do is they can actually show you what the construction will look like before the project starts. Augmented reality is becoming into the real world. It's, it's, uh, it's getting really, really um, interesting out there. Uh, we, there was a medical VR AR at Stanford on April 5th, uh, 2008. I mean, people are really starting to think about how to use augmented reality in the real world. You can do a surgery before, before you go in and you can see vitals on the person's body before, before you even start doing any of the diagnostics. So. Again, um, AR is coming into its own. So I just want to spend a little bit of time getting deeper into how, where AR, AR came from and how it works. Now, when I say AR for the masses, I'm talking about AR on mobile, right? Because if we did AR on a billion dollar um, virtual cave or we did it you know, in some other complex system that no one can get their hands on, it's useless. But today or very near the future, all of us are gonna be able to do augmented reality uh, out of the f with the phones we have in our pockets. So it makes it augmented reality for the world. Now, we're gonna cover uh, three pieces of augmented reality. We're gonna talk about how to build it with AR Core. We're gonna talk about how to build on AR Kit. And we're gonna talk about how to use it with Unity and Unreal. I wanna make a quick distinction between um, AR and VR. When you When you talk about being immersed in the real world, in reality, that's on one side of the spectrum. And then when you're saying, I am completely detached from the real world, that's the other set, uh, part of the spectrum. Uh, VR, you're completely detached from the world. AR, you're kind of in the center because you're looking at the world and you're having computer images put on to the canvas of the real world that you're looking at. VR is a big ask, right? Because what you're talking about VR, you're saying, I want you to completely disengage from reality uh, and it has no bearing in reality and you know, you're, you're completely isolated from reality. Where for me, AR makes a lot more sense because you're saying you're engaging in the world enhanced. So having someone cover up their eyes, cover up their ears, cover up everything, I think is a big ask where I think if we say we're talking about augmented reality, we're all gonna be living in an augmented reality world in the future. We're just gonna take um, information and put it on top of the, the, the physical world we live in. Now, it's kind of ridiculous to say, you know what, if you wanna use augmented reality, what you have to do is you have to walk around all day with your phone in front of your face, right? And this is like how augmented reality works. Um, and like this, I, I'm not gonna get there. I'm not gonna walk around all day with the phone in front of my face. But if I have something like uh, augmented reality built into my glasses or a way where my hands are free and I can use augmented reality all the time, that completely makes sense to me. So I'm looking for a better system that has me walking around with my phone all the time. Now, we all know what augmented reality is. We've been doing it for a long time. Anytime you take uh, any kind of digital information and you put it on top of the physical world, that is augmented reality. We, uh, Snapchat does, has been doing this for, for a long time with their um, putting uh, ears on people. We've been doing it with, uh, with markers and uh, yeah, it's been around for a long time. In fact, augmented reality started out in uh, 1992 and people were building all sorts of different uh, augmented reality systems. And then in 2007, it absolutely exploded. And the reason it exploded is because every single one of us started walking around with augmented, augmented reality device in our hands. We had the CPU, we had the camera, the accelerometer, the GPS, solid state compass. We had everything we needed to start doing augmented reality and we started seeing augmented reality show up everywhere. These were uh, a couple of the, of the very first um, augmented reality systems that we saw out there. The 
the one you see with the lady was a connect system and she would just stand there and uh, move her fingers and different clothing would, would come onto her body so she could see what the clothing looked like as, um, as it was being placed on her. Um, the next one is a app that was running on one of the very first Android phones. What it did was it allowed tourists to know what pieces of um, interesting sites were around them. So basically you download the app. The app knew from the accelerometer and the gyroscope which way the phone was pointing and it could figure out, it could talk to the cloud and say, okay, the GPS tells me he's here. I can tell from the accelerometer and the gyroscope he's pointing into this direction. Read the database, tell me what interesting things are around him and I'm gonna take that information I'm going to go to the activity that he has and I'm going to put a marker on it. And that's one of the very first augmented reality apps that were, that was uh, being um, on the Android phone. Now, this augmented reality app, this is a rear view mirror that you're looking at in a car. In real time, what's happening is it's looking at the highway traffic of the cars like two miles ahead of this car and saying, what lane should you go in so that you're not gonna hit any traffic? The problem with this is that, so if you surf, what you do is you get up really, really early morning and you go down to the beach and go surfing because you wanna avoid all the crowds, right? But then everyone does that. So everyone gets up super early, goes down to the beach to go surfing and then the crowd shows up. Same thing with this app, right? So if everyone is looking at the same uh, line that, that you are, then you're like, okay, this far right lane is going to be completely empty and they all move into that. So that's one of the problems. And I think Waves actually has that problem also where it starts directing people to the same non-busy streets and they, they create their own, um, own problems. But I should turn that off. Sorry. So, uh, and... This is, this is an interesting uh, AR uh, slide I found, and it has to be completely wrong because this is phony. At the time that this was taken, we did not have the technology necessary to be able to know where that road is so that we could put the AR images properly on the road. Today we can, and I'm going to show you how that works. But when this type of AR was coming out, that was just photoshopped because at that time we couldn't find the plane in that picture. So I thought that was very interesting. One of the very first uh, AR apps I ever saw, sorry, yeah, one of the very first AR apps I ever saw was this example that came out of uh, Qualcomm. And we, ha uh, Rock'em Sock'em Robots had an issue because if they wanted to build Rock'em Sock'em Robots, what they had to do was they had to build a factory, get the plastic, uh, com um, design all of the pieces, put them into a box and ship them out. So they worked with, with Qualcomm and they said, we would just want an AR app. And what you see is you go to your printer and you print out this piece of, uh, you print out this piece of paper and you download the Qualcomm app and it runs an AR application that uses the fiducial uh, markers on this piece of paper to know where those two robots are. It sends it to the cloud. The cloud figures out where your opponent's um, robots are doing, merges it all together, and then shows it to you in real time. And this was exciting for all of us, right? This is way before AR Kit and AR Core, but we could see at that point the tremendous advantages of working in AR. I can build an entire city and have it almost instantaneously give me a 3D representation of what the city looks like without any material cost. And so um, Qualcomm said, look, if you, anyone wants to play this game, download our, our app, go to your printer, print it out, and you can start playing it. My gosh, I mean, that is, that is almost no cost to, to, to uh, own Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Now, one of the funny things about the, fiduci about the fiduciary markers is the camera just looks at where the marker is and then puts the AR image on it. So if you were to hold this image in midair, 
the, 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 uh, the tank still comes out of midair because it has no concept of what's around it. It just knows where the, uh, where the, um, where the marker is and then puts the error image on top of it. We've gotten much better at this now. But this was the, one of the very first uh, examples of uh, augmented reality. So you can see it doesn't know, it has no concept of what's going on. It just uh, runs, runs the, the image. Uh, this was the very first Augmented Reality Open Source Kit. I think it's still live, but basically the way it worked is it would capture your camera, it would get your compass information and your GPS information, your accelerometer information, and you could tell it where in the world you wanted to put various AR markers. Much, this is pretty easy to work with. The Rock'em Sock'em robots needed the Q -car, Q Car SDK from Qualcomm, which you had to license from Qualcomm, and it got kind of tricky about who owned what, and you, it was very complex to use. Thank, thankfully, we have ARKit and ARCore, so we don't have to worry about this anymore. But I just wanted to show this was very, very complex, and now we do ARKit with three lines. Um, I used to go through a lot of examples of AR, but I, I actually stopped because People after the, the, the talk would come up and say, oh, I have, I have way better examples of augmented reality than, you know, than that. So now I just kind of show one or two. And if people want to go off and find lots of augmented reality um, applications, uh, they can find them online. What is super interesting about this game that they built is that it's a perspective game. And if you're going to do something in augmented reality, the perspective is the best thing to use. So basically, you have this little soldier walking, and he comes across uh, different uh, bridges. And you have to move in a way where the bridge looks like it's, uh, it's connected. Uh, if you watch when he's walking, there are times that the bridge looks, when you look down on it, the bridge looks um, like it, it, it doesn't um, go across. But from a different perspective, it does look like they're joined. And that's a very good use of the, of the augmented reality uh, game because what you're doing is you're showing all the different aspects of the 3D model. You're forcing people to walk all the way around the 3D model. So I thought that was very interesting. But, you know, I saw an example of someone who made an AR car and it would drive up and down the street. And if you squeal the tires, it leads track marks on the road. So, you know, people are just doing really amazing things with augmented reality. And uh, you can go back to that slide and, and look deeper into more examples. So when we want to talk about the evolution of uh, how we got augmented reality on the phone, I really want to start with Tango. Tango was a project from Google to do 3D mapping with the phone. It comes with uh, three cameras, right? It has a 23 megapixel uh, camera, a, a two uh, different types, and then a depth camera. And what, it, what they would do with it is they would do motion tracking, and they would use uh, visual features and the accelerometer and the GPS to make indoor maps. It has uh, six degrees of freedom. It does X, Y, Z, yaw, pitch, roll, and the seventh dimension they do time, which allows them to track uh, indoor mapping really, really well. And so there was a huge buzz uh, uh, around Tango and its ability to do 3D mapping. But the, the problem was that uh, it needed a lot of cameras and a lot of processing power, but especially the cameras to do this. Now, um, when it came out, there was the uh, Asuzu Zen phone for $599, and then Lenovo came out with one for $499, and these both ran Tango, and you can go do Tango development on them. But then AR Core came out, and uh, Google said, you know what, we're discontinuing both of those. And it just reminded me of the time that, uh, I don't know if you guys remember, but there was a time when uh, Nokia was building Windows 9 phones, right? So basically, they were getting all the sources ready to build the Windows 9 phone, and they were building their, their factories and everything. And then Microsoft comes by and says, we're not supporting Windows 9 anymore. 
everything's going to be Windows 10, and we're not ever going to do anything with Windows 9. And here's Nokia just about bringing these, these phones up. That's what happened with, uh, with, uh, with these phones also. They were just coming up into, man, into, develop, uh, into sales, uh, and Google says, no more daydream handsets, no more Tango phones. And it really makes you wonder, like, okay, what are you going to replace it with? And they said, we're, we're now only doing AR core. And then you think to yourself, fantastic, these phones are super cheap. I'm going to run out and I'm going to buy a, a Zen phone so I can do AR core. No, 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 no. <laughs> these phones cannot do AR core. And you're like, okay, why not? And that is the core of how um, augmented reality works now. So now they say we do AR core. We don't need the depth sensing camera. We don't need the IR tracking or the blasting. It's just a normal camera. You're like, wow, that's amazing how they do that. They do it because the phones these days have an internal measurement unit. Now, we all have internal measurement units in us. The way it works is if I close my eyes and I take a step back, right, I can easily step forward to the exact position that I step back because I have an internal measurement unit. I can turn exactly and face you uh, 90 degrees and I know I'm facing you guys, I don't have to look. I have an internal measurement unit that can, allows me to know where I am without, um, without any external uh, stimulation. So this chip knows with dead reckoning how much it's moved. And so it allows the, the phone to know, um, its internal measurement unit does dead reckoning, it knows how much it's moving. So this allows it to do simultaneous localization and mapping. This is the same technology that self-driving cars use, right? Uh, as they're moving, they're um, mapping the environment around them depending on their uh, different sensors they have and how fast they're traveling and, and what their sensors are doing. And that's called SLAM. So when, when people are talking about uh, how do you do augmented reality? You hear the word uh, slam a lot and then the internal measurement unit. So with one camera, how am I able to get a three-dimensional image? And this is the way it works. So I, I hold up my camera and I take one picture. I have a whole bunch of pixels, right? It just colors on a screen. I have, I have a bunch of colors on a screen. I take another picture. I have a bunch of colors on the screen. And you're like, okay, how are you making a three-dimensional uh, image out of these pixels? What happens is I, I can now start saying, because I have dead reckoning and I know exactly the position that the phone was, was pointing to, I can start figuring out what points were the same. And I build a point cloud, right? So picture and then picture, picture, all these pictures are coming into me, and I'm able to say, you know what? Because I know how much you move the phone, and I know which way you're pointing the phone, I can start saying these points are probably the same. And now that I have a point cloud, I can start saying the points that are closer to me are moving more than the points that are farther from me. And that, therefore, I can do three-dimensional uh, analysis on it and get depth, right? So with one camera, with the dead reckoning, internal measurements, I'm now able to make a point cloud. And from that point cloud, what I do is I say, OK, anywhere I see three points that sit in a, in a, in a triangle right, that are in the same plane, I'm going to say that's a flat surface. Now I know where to put my anchors. right? Because if I wanted to take a, a augmented reality model and put it somewhere, it would be utterly ridiculous for me to take an augmented reality desk and then put it in the middle of the, of the, of the sky, right? I mean, no one would buy it. But because um, I am now able to build a point cloud, the point cloud allows me to find these triangles. These triangles tell me where the vertical surfaces are. I know that when you touch the screen, I'm going to project from my screen into my point cloud. When I hit a a place that I believe is a plane, now I know where to anchor my model on that plane, right? So picture, 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 point cloud, point cloud makes a, uh, makes a plane, 
I touch the screen, it makes a projection to a plane, I know where to put my anchor. Those terms are the same exact objects that we're going to use when we build it with AR core. So the, everything I just said, those words, those are actual objects in the system that I'm going to point. When we go through the source code, you're going to see those words. Now, if I take my camera and I put it on a tripod, this will never work, right? Because I have to move to figure out which pixels are closer to me and which pixels are farther to me, right? And it will never work if I don't have shadows, right? Because if I don't have shadows, then I'm not going to be able to, 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 to distinguish different, um, uh, different items. So it will not work in low light. It will not work without shadows. And it will not work without motion. You need all three of those things. So here we see this example. And what they're doing is as they're moving across this table, it's, being, it, it's doing all of the analysis I said and saying, OK, I can now see where the plane is. And when you touch, I'm gonna, I know where to put the AR anchor. With AR core 2, they just figured out how to do vertical planes. So if you're using AR version 1, you can only do the table and ground. You can't do any vertical surfaces. AR2, you can do vertical surfaces. Now, why do I give so much credit to iOS? I give tons of credit to iOS because iOS came up with the constraint library first. AI, iOS came up with storyboards, storyboards first. iOS has always been like the the leader in mobile. And here again, we see that uh, Google I.O. was May 19, 2007. And I was there, and they talked about Tango for hours. They had demos on Tango, Tango this, Tango that. Then AR Kit was released June 6, June 5, 2017. And then AR Core was released August 29, 2017. And it was never even mentioned uh, on May 19, 2017 at Google I.O. So it looks like to me like a knee-jerk reaction. AR Core was released because of AR Kit. Um, and it's really interesting because one of the things they said is AR Core will be able to run on a wide variety of sensors and phones. When they said that, it only ran on the Pixel and the Samsung S8 or something, or S7 or something. So they, it, it's almost like, you know, we're there, but we only run on two phones. <laughs> Where on uh, AR Kit from iOS, it went back all the way to the iPhone SE, which is a pretty old phone. So I think they've been working on this for a lot longer. Now, we're going to talk about AR Core first, and then we're going to talk about AR Kit. AR Core can do motion tracking, which means as you're walking around, it knows uh, where ver certain uh, objects are in, in, in the space. It does environmental understanding. Um, which is important for us when we want to put anchors down, and then light estimation, because if you don't get the lighting right, your mind just doesn't believe in it. So the major, the major uh, pieces of um, AR Core are, it does uh, position and orientation. So as I walk around this table, say I have an AR um, model on here, the AR model does not move because, it can, because it's in real time uh, calculating what that uh, table plane looks like and where it is. Um, so it uses all its sensors to do this thing called uh, pose, which is position and orientation. And then it does concurrent odometer mapping, which people call COM. Um, and it uses the gyroscope and the IMU and all the uh, different uh, sensors on it to be able to tell to track objects in real time uh, as you walk through the virtual scene. It does uh, environmental understanding so that it can detect horizontal uh, surfaces and uh, different feature points. Today, uh, with AR Core 2, it can also do vertical surfaces. And light estimation is extremely important because if you have a dark room and you have a light model and you move the light model into the dark room, your mind just goes, that just does not belong. So to be able to do photorealistic models and have them uh, be a part of your environment is super important. In fact, with AR kit, if this was a pure metal uh, model, when I put it down, you would see the reflection of this cable. Um, or if I had a banana and I put it here, 
the banana would reflect into the AR surface and reflect back down so your mind actually cannot tell the difference between the uh, banana and the photorealistic water bottle. That's super important for us to be able to uh, get the kind of uh, environment we want to be able to work in. Now, I put these links up here. If someone's new to how to build Android, because you have to understand a little bit of Android to be able to work with AR Core, I have some links here. And then uh, if you want to learn a little bit about uh, OpenGL, which you don't really need OpenGL to be able to work with AR Core 2, um, I have that link. And then uh, the next link is Poly. Now, if anyone in the world can do augmented reality with three lines of code, there's no brainer, right? Any, everyone's going to make AR, AR applications. The, the part that's going to separate us is who can be more imaginative, right? Because every, anyone can write three lines of code. My, my dog can write three lines of code, but he doesn't have the imagination to do an AR app. Um, so Poly is a place where you can go get your AR models from. Uh, and I really love this one because if you look, the reflection of this boat in the water is actually not made by painting on the water. It's made by the augmented reality that's on the bottom of the, of the, um, of, of the uh, object. So it looks like it's a reflection in the water, but it's actually a 3D model. And so if you come to Poly, they have lots of wonderful models for you to use um, to make your, your apps. And what, what's wonderful is all you have to do to use an app is give credit to the person who made it in your app. So I believe the license for people, when they put their model up on Poly, is everyone can use it. No restrictions, just give the author credit. And if you don't agree with that license, then I don't think you can put your, your uh, models up on Poly. Now, remember how I did all that hand gesturing and I said uh, these are the core pieces of how you build an, uh, an AR core app? This is the GitHub repository that does an AR app for uh, version one. If you look through the code, you will see that the uh, the objects they're bringing in is a session, right? So you bring a session up. Uh, the frame, remember I was like, I'm making frames. This is how, this is the part of the code that makes the frame. And then once I have my frames, I make my point cloud. Once I make my point cloud, I can find my planes. Uh, this is where the code for the planes are. And then uh, I have my anchor so that when you touch the screen, I know what uh, plane you're talking to and I can put my anchor down. Once I have my anchor down, I can put my, uh, my uh, model on top of that. So if you look at this um, GitHub repository, and these lines will actually show you in, uh, in that code uh, how we set up the, the scene, how we set up the plane, uh, then you got to walk around. Um, and then the anchors, and then uh, rendering the assets. Now this is version one. Version two, it's three lines. So we're going to actually look at version two because it's far easier. And again, um, these are the objects that are generated. And we already are know what these objects do because we kind of uh, talked about them. Anchoring it, setting up the configure. The frame is the frame that I talked about. The hit result is when you touch the screen, uh, light estimation, um, the point cloud, uh, the positioning, and then the session. So um, now... AR Core 2 was just released, and it added some much, much needed uh, functionality. One of the things is, like, I'm going to build an AR app, and then I'm going to put it on this, on this table, and I'm looking through it with my phone. What does that mean to you? Absolutely nothing. And the reason it means nothing to you is because you can't share the experience with me. But AR Core 2 solves that by having these things that are called cloud anchors, so that when I map this room, find out where the planes are, put my model on this, on this uh, plane here on the table, it is shared, and anyone can, using AR Core 2 can, can now enjoy the model I made, interact with it, and we can actually have a a shared experience where I'm playing with the model and they're also playing with the model and we, we're both interacting. Before AR Core 
two came out, that was impossible. So there would be a model and, um, you know, I would be watching it uh, and there would be no way for anyone else to experience what I'm experiencing. Now, we're going to get into the code in a, in a couple minutes, but it's extremely easy to make an AR app. So as an Android developer, um, we build with fragments. Uh, fragments are parts of views, right? So when we bring up Android Studio, uh, we can go to the XML and we can make a, a, a fragment. Um, for AR, we make a AR fragment. And this AR fragment can go anywhere a normal fragment can go. So if, you're, if you have a web view fragment or you have a different control fragment, you can always just pull those fragments out and just put an AR fragment in. That's how easy it is to work with AR now. Um, once you have your, your uh, fragment in your activity, then you just render the model. And the models that you can bring in support uh, Wavefront, OBG, uh, FBX, uh, GLTF2. Uh, um, and if you want to mo learn more about those how those uh, assets work. Um, I have a link to, let's see, I have a link that explains how those formats fit into, um, oh, am I getting to it? Yes, this link right here, when you click on it, it explains those formats. So we're, we'll get there. So once you, once you, super easy, you just, in the XML, you make a frame, uh, a fragment. Then you go to poly and you get uh, a wavefront OB, OBJ uh, and you put that into Android Studio. And then um, on that frame, you just do a set on tap AR uh, plane listener. And when someone taps on it, your model shows up. Literally, it's like, a couple lines of code, and if you go to Google I.O. 2018, there's a session called um, uh, Build uh, Model Repeat. Um, it's an AR session, and the guy in, I think, like five minutes writes an entire AR app. So uh, that is definitely um, something you should check out if you're interested to see that. Now, if you want to learn uh, more about AR Core version one. Uh, Coursera has a very nice class in it, so you can follow that link and take that class. But if you don't want to learn um, Android development and you're already a Unity or Unreal um, uh, developer, working in Unreal and Unity to build uh, augmented reality apps it's the workflow is exactly the same. It feels extremely natural. And for a, a, a Unity or Unreal person, it's extremely easy to, to build AR apps because the, they, they uh, kind of hit all of the AR stuff and you feel like you're just making a normal Unity app. Now, one of the things you'll notice here is that, let me see here, um, this, uh, Okay, this model does not move, right? So a lot of times when you're looking, what happens is you, the, the triangles are the plane, right? So the augmented reality system ran and it found the plane, the guy touched the ground and the and anchor was made and then the model was put down. So what you notice the model does not move. And if you want your model to run around, you actually have to move your anchor around. Right, because most of the time when you see these augmented reality um, uh, demos, what's happening is uh, they're, they're just sitting on an anchor. Now, Google understands writing AR is super easy. Building models is very difficult. So they came out with a bunch of tools to help people build models. Um, they built this tool called Blocks and Tilt Brush. Uh, these are links, and you can go see how people use blocks to build AR models. Um, here's some examples. Uh, also, Tilt Brush. So the models are really the, the star of AR, and um, a lot of people are working really hard to help you guys make really good models. Um, this is the 
This is the uh, document I was talking about that explains exactly how does scene form, which is uh, the technology behind doing augmented reality on AR Core 2, how, uh, how the asset file uh, generates the model. So if you have any questions about, um, you know, how do I, what kind of models can I use, what's supported, how do I change my model, this page describes all that. And, let's see here. Ah. Okay. So, um, uh, sorry. Okay. One of the things, uh, we have very good asset stores. So Unity has an asset store. I also I already mentioned uh, Poly on Google and Unreal has a marketplace. When you get your, your assets, some of the things you can, you can kind of play with is uh, the metallicness of it. So what the metallicness of it does is if you have something that's metallic, um, it will pick up reflections from the things around it, and you can actually change how metallic your your uh, your objects are, and it's all based on physics. If you look on this uh, on this mirroring, you'll notice that things that are closer to me are um, kind of not. You're not able to see it, but as you go farther away, you can see it, and that's all physics based. Uh, these models follow all that physics. And that's super important. So the, the base color, how the light enters the material and reflects the roughness of it, um, how shadows interact with it. And also, you know, we talk about the, um, uh, what it looks like when light hits it. So all these can be changed inside Android Studio. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Now, we talked a lot about AR Core. I really want to give a lot of credit to ARKit because ARKit actually came first. Um, and it comes, and you can tell because it, they support so many phones when they released it. They've been thinking about this for a long time. One of the things that uh, ARKit can do that uh, AR Core can't yet is be, it, the iPhone has this true depth camera, and the true depth camera. Uh, can get its front facing, so it points to the face of the person. Um, and in real time, it can get an idea of uh, what the person's face is doing, their expressions. And it can map that to an augmented reality uh, emoji. So uh, kind of cool. Uh, it follows a lot of the same principles that we've been talking about. Uh, maybe in the future, we'll see pieces of Tango come back because, uh, um, you know, they, they took out all the cameras. They might move some of it back to be able to do this kind of thing that iOS is being able to do. When you look at how ARKit works, what you'll notice is that we have a configuration that comes up, and it starts an AR session. The AR session fits inside of an AR view. The AR view you can kind of think of as the, the, the fragment that we were talking about. So you're like, okay, the AR view ma maps to the AR fragment. The AR session maps to what uh, the session that, that the um, AR core was talking about. This guy's AR frame is very similar to the AR frame that AR core had. And then they both have anchors. And once you start looking at this technology, you come to the realization that they take a lot of the same models and they talk the same terms and they use a lot of the same technologies. So you know, there's a direct correlation between how ARKit works and how AR, how, um, AR Core works. Now, ARKit has three rendering engines. SpriteKit does two-dimensional. Uh, SceneKit does three-dimensional. And Metal is more like uh, a graphics, graphics language. You can use, on ARKit, you can use any of those three. I would say use uh, SpriteKit because it's by far the easiest to work with. Scene kit is easier, but you don't get the three-dimensional. You get these posters running around instead of three-dimensional models. Um, this is kind of like the, 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 the rendering pipeline. Again, we're, we're, we're seeing that we have the configuration. It makes the session. The session makes the frames. The frames make the planes. Very, very similar. Some of the nice things that uh, AR 
Kit 2 added was just like AR Core, we can now have shared experiences because we have a world map and we have persistence. It does environmental texturing where I was talking before, they have a very nice demo on, on, online where they take a ball, they make it metallic, and then suddenly the, the, the wood reflects into the ball, and then they put a banana next to it, and uh, the banana reflects into the, into the sphere, into the metal sphere. And that kind of environmental texturing, photorealistic, it just makes your mind believe that the model's uh, really, really true. Um, they also have, uh, they can do image tracking. So if you buy a magazine, you can throw the magazine on the table when you, when you open it. An AR model will show up. And as you walk around, uh, the model will be properly placed on the magazine. So they added that to, in uh, AR Kit 2. They can do uh, object detection. So the clouds they're generating, they can use them later to, to identify objects. And they're doing face tracking. So all this was added in AR Core 2. And if you wanted to learn AR Kit, uh, you, there's a class from uh, Udacity for, uh, to learn it in Unity and a class to learn it in Swift. So um, now Udacity was kind of started by Googlers. So I'm really thinking that AR Core will also be uh, here pretty soon too. The interesting thing is that you don't have to do it in Swift. You can actually do it in Unity. Um, AR Unity covers, uh, ha, it does AR Kit, it does AR Core, and they have their own. So if you do it in, uh, if you do your augmented reality inside of Unity, you actually deploy to both of them at the same, you deploy to AR Kit and AR Core at the same time. Unreal is exactly the same. Uh, it feels very natural to do uh, AR Kit or AR Core in Unreal. And in fact, um, again, uh, Unreal, Unity, amazing uh, platforms, uh, and they both uh, publish to Apple and iOS. Now, one of the interesting things is the people at Unity said, look, AR Kit and AR Core, the terminology is the same, the pipeline's the same. Everything looks exactly the same. So instead of using, uh, in, in Unity, instead of using like the AR kit or the AR core building this way, they have this thing that's called the AR interface. And when you use their AR interface, they will build to both platforms and you don't have to know anything specific about what platform you're building to. Um, they handle all that for you. And it's mostly because they're very, very similar. And um, so at BioCodes, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do the, the demo now, um, but I just wanted to say at BioCodes, if you guys wanted to get the agenda to see where all the code is and where all the slides are, um, it's there. Now, I'm gonna show you guys in uh, Android Studio uh, a little bit of AR Core. Unfortunately, uh, the last couple times I ran, so I am running on a beta version of Mojave, which is the operating system. I'm running on a beta version of Android Studio. I'm running on a beta version of the AR plugin for Android Studio. And I'm running on a beta version of the emulator. So it sometimes crashes, but we're gonna give this a shot. So if you remember, I said building an AR uh, app is extremely easy. Let me see here. Uh, I should have blown this up. Okay, I need help. How, do you guys know how to bring this larger? It's what? Uh, preferences. Where is it? Appearance? You guys, oh man, I should have done that. I didn't realize the resolution was going to go so high. Uh, editor? Font? Uh, uh, 32? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. So the, um, remember I said it's extremely easy, right? So it's three steps. I get this fragment, right? And this fragment is, is the normal fragment that I have always worked with when I, when I work with Android. So if I come in here and I look at my layout, uh, I can see it's the same exact 
fragment. I've always worked with it, except this time it's just an AR fragment. Great. Now that I have my AR fragment, step one. Step two is simply rendering my model, right? So I have this uh, uh, model rendering dot build. And all it does is it says, okay, go get Andy and go ahead and build him. Literally like two lines of code. He's getting Andy from here. This is Andy. And remember what I was talking to you about the metallic, the roughness, that's where all these numbers are being set. And there's actually a viewer. We can come in here and we can change the metallicness of him. And when we save it, it will re-render it so we can see what it looks like. So I just increase his, his metallicness. And I can actually walk around him. I can change his roughness, make him less metallic and less rough. And when I save it, um, it will update the model in, in real time. Uh, so you can, actually, you can actually play with your models in real time. Uh, going back to that document that I showed you that talks about how, to, uh, how, how the model is um, interpolated uh, and how it's built. And you can actually change your model. Now, one of the really cool things they added is we can run this on the emulator. Because before I had to run on the phone and I had to show it to everybody, but we're, we're going to actually run on the emulator if my machine doesn't crash. So, it's going to build the AR frame. It's going to load the model. And then it's going to build a, a, a scene. Um, it's going to look for planes. It's going to generate an anchor when I touch the screen. So OK, here we go. Hopefully, it'll work. All right, I'm going to start this guy up. There's a better one that we're going to do after this one, which is the entire solar system. And it's a solar system with all of the planets revolving and then the moon revolving around the, the Earth. Uh, and I'll show you how, how that one was built also. But let's see if we get this, this guy running. And then if, that, if this runs in, we'll do, sorry. Uh, OK. What happened? Did my machine die? Um, my screen's blank. So, <laughs> I will, well, like, we'll, we'll try this again real quick. So, yeah, my machine died. Wow. It, not surprised. I'm not surprised. I'm really pushing things. I, I, like I said, everything is absolute beta. I just downloaded the latest version of AR Core. So, what happens is, um, when you, when you bring down Android Studio, uh, it allows you to go to the Android Studio plugins and download the plugin to do AR Core. So you download that into Android Studio, and then you get that viewer that I was showing. Um, and then the emulator, you have to go get the AR Core from Google and then sideload it into the emulator. So the plugin, you get through uh, the Android Studio plugin. The, um, the actual AR core to run in the emulator you get from Google, and you just use the ADB command to, to, to load it. All right, we're going to try this one more time. All right. OK. OK, fantastic. Ah. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, oh, man. Maybe it just needs a little bit more juice. Let me give it a little bit more juice. It's a really cool app. Uh, I hope I could demo it. We'll give it one more shot. It's, I will say it's not my screensaver, and I will say uh, it does work. I was just playing with it, and it did work. Okay, let's try this one more time. And the solar system one is really cool because all the planets are turning and, there, and there's cards on top of the planets that give you information about, uh, more information about all the various different planets. Okay, so I have plenty of power. My screen lock is not on. <laughs> All right, 
Fingers crossed. I have power. It looks great on my screen. Ta-da! Nothing. Oh, my machine's, my machine's frozen. Okay. It, my machine gets burning hot when I do this. When I'm experimenting with the uh, emulator the, on AR core, it just starts burning up. And um, anything else I can say without bringing this guy up? Uh, yeah, my machine's frozen. <laughs> So basically, it's wonderful that we can use the emulator. Uh, it works very well unless you're doing a presentation. And you can actually try your models. Um, the, oh, my machine's like, the, the model for the solar system is very interesting because you're set, I wish I could show you the source code. You're setting up and what, what you do is you say, okay, once, once the frames are being built, I'm going to find the planes. When I touch the screen, it, it makes an anchor to the ground, and then the solar system is going to be put on that anchor. It's going to say, the, one of the, in the code, you can see one of the nodes is the sun, and then from that node, we build the other planets, and then the Earth is a node, and around that goes the moon. So when you walk through the code, you can actually see how they built the solar system uh, Okay, we're going to try the simulator one more time. Cross our fingers. We have a little bit more power. Coming up. It actually uh, uh, completely um, froze, my, uh, froze the kernel of my computer because it was just, the entire thing was locked. It was pretty impressive. I've never seen any application be able to do that. Yes, yes, okay, so now, got it. One of the things they say is hit the option key and you can move around, but what you notice is when you hit the option key, it kind of goes insane. A better way to do it is you hit this uh, virtual sensors and you move it by moving it here. Because then it just, it's a, it's a very soft movement. Instead of when you push the option key, it kind of like goes a little nuts. Okay. Now, I need to move it around a little bit so that it figures out um, where the plane is. Because if we hold it still, it's never going to find a place to anchor. Oh. Uh, Oh, the, the, what's on the TV? No, not that I know of. Because what I want to do is I actually, uh, I actually want to move around this room a little bit so that I can find it, get it to see a surface. And as soon as it sees a surface, at that point, I'll put down my, uh, my model. And uh, when I put down my model, you'll see the solar system. Let me go ahead and just uh, move around a little. Okay, see it? It's right there. So I clicked on, that's the pattern right there. And you can see he put, uh, see this little yellow, this guy here? That's the augmented reality image he put on. And I know it's hard to see and the, and the emulator is going a little crazy right now. But uh, yes, that is, this is the model that we just put down. <laughs> kind of kludgy. Okay, I want to show you the code for the, um, for the solar system, and then we'll wrap it up with uh, any questions. So the solar system, let's see. Um, close this project. We're going to open up the solar system. The solar system's really cool. All right. You can actually see the different planets. Did I open its building? Uh, 
Okay. Um, I'm looking down here in my resources. I would normally see uh, my various planets, and I would click on them, and I could actually see them coming up in the, in the renderer. Oh, they're my assets. So I can just come over here, and I can actually see Mars, and I can actually play around with it, right? I can change its base color. I can change its metallic. I can change all of those different uh, shadowing on it right here, recompile, and get an idea of what my model looks like. And do that with uh, all my different planets, right? Um, when I want to build it, Let's see, uh, it's the same thing. I just have um, my, ooh, maybe I made it a little too big now. But basically what you'll notice uh, when you go through the code is it's setting up nodes and then those nodes uh, hold the different uh, models and that's what allows the solar system to sit together. I want to try to see if we can do the demo of this. One last thing before I let you guys go. Let's see if we can get the demo of, uh, of this working. I think I'm asking too much of it. <laughs> okay, let's see. It's installing the APK. Okay, so... If I walk around a little bit, I should be able to get the point clouds to generate. And then once the point clouds generate, oh, sorry, I want to move. I will put the model down, and you'll see the solar system in the emulator running. And all the planets will be rotating, and it's pretty cool. Man, you guys should hear my fan. It is just dying. <laughs> my machine's like, what's going on? Okay, there it is. So this is the point cloud. If I click on the point cloud, it's going to put an anchor there, and there's the solar system. Yes, the emulator goes wonky as soon as I put the model down, and this is the best I can do. But you can see, uh, you can see the model. It's sitting right here, and the planets are turning, and the shadows are being put on the carpet. Uh, and the shadows are being rendered properly uh, as the model runs. So uh, with that, I'll take any questions. Yeah. It is. You can build it in Maya. You can build it in uh, various uh, platforms that will generate the three types of uh, output I, I, I showed earlier. So OBG... Um, uh, yeah, Seamform has what models it can take, but yeah, absolutely, you can build them in Maya. And then you can use those in, Unity. in what? Unity. Absolutely, absolutely. In fact, that's what, how how most people make their models. Yeah. Well, the problem is that it has to build up enough of a point cloud to figure out where the planes are. And if you're moving around, it's very difficult for it to figure out what is a plane and what's not a plane. So the only way this code works is when it makes the point cloud, it looks for triangles that are in the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, plane. And then, it's, and then it, it calls that uh, a solid surface. So if you have a person walking around, that's going to confuse the system into trying to figure out where the point clouds are and, and where the anchors could land. If everything is static, how long is that confusion? Um, right, so as you saw, when I was moving it around, it got it pretty quickly. And it just depends on how much, uh, how much um, uh, contrast. You need a lot of contrast, because if you don't have enough contrast, it's really hard for the system to figure out what points are the same between the various frames. And it needs to know what points are the same between the various frames so that it can figure out where the point clouds are and how far the, each, each point is from each other point. So if you have a repetitive eye technique, you're going to get like Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Can you add uh, Google 3D glasses, VR kind of experience to this AR experience together? 
Absolutely. So that's called mixed reality. And a lot of people, what they're doing is with the VR glasses, they're putting a front-facing camera on it, and they're bringing the physical world into the VR world. So instead of seeing this chair, I would look at it. The chair physically would be there, but it would be the throne, the, the iron throne, and I would go sit in it. Now, when I sit, I don't fall through the ground because it actually is a physical chair. It's just the physical chair from Thor Game of Thrones. Very true. Very true. That's, that's a very true statement. Okay. I, I don't know what Apple and Google are going to do in those kind of mixed. They don't have anything yet, and Microsoft does. That's very true. Very true. Any other questions? Yes. Once you have one of these models, how do you deliver it to users? You can't have that side loading software. Sorry, let me explain. This is Android Studio, yeah. right? So what happens is I just take my models and I add them to my assets. And once I take my models uh, and they take, like these are uh, SBF formatted models, I go ahead and I add them to my assets, they get compiled into the application. And that APK moves into that app store. And when I download the apps from the app store, uh, that application can now look for cloud anchors. It can use the models that I rendered, uh, that I, that I, bundled with the APK, it can start using all those assets. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. The other question is, is, is that the only thing they need to download, or must they first have also downloaded some, some AR? Right. Foundation? Right. So AR, um, in, on the Play Store, there is an application that you download, um, and it's free, and you have to download that, you download that, and then AR Core will run. Yes, absolutely. I think future phones will have this plugin already uh, on the phones, but for today, um, they they don't ship with it. So you would go to that to the Google Play Store and download it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think they do. And if you look at this uh, document here, this document describes in detail how SceneForm, which is the AR2 uh, technology that we've been talking about, um, this is the reference document that talks about how those models all uh, are used by uh, SceneForm and the various types of models it takes. Um, and those uh, models will fit into this. So um, that's why Unity uh, is so uh, excited about this because all the models people are making for Unity, they can just go ahead and load into this. It, as long as they have, like if you have it in another type, just, just use Maya to move it into like Wavefront OBJ file and then, move, and then load it into here. But generally, I think the models that they're making will load. I'm not sure of all the different types of models out there, but the mo majority that I've seen will work with ARKit and ARCore because of the major formats are, are supported. Any other questions? With that, I thank you. Thanks for your time, you guys.
as a dream.